Let's say if there was a sign that mentioned the average depth of the river was no more than 3 feet, would you cross the river? Probability distribution is not just a theoretical concept in statistics, but it also has real-world applications. So in this video, we will look at some applications from real life where we can use probability distribution and why it is so necessary to know it. I hope you're holding strong and happy. That is because this is how everyone should be. Welcome to another video from Learning Puri, a channel for applied learning. Stay with me to get tips and tutorials to grow faster in your professional and personal life. So if you're new here, do consider subscribing to the channel and click the notification bell to remind you when I post a new video. This video is second in the series of three videos on probability distribution. The first one is this video over here for which the link is posted in the description below and the info card above. I will urge you to watch this video till the end so that you don't miss out on the real life applications of probability distribution the discussion on different probability distributions used most often and some thumb rules on when to use them. All right, so let us get growing. Imagine you have gone hiking, trekking or overlanding in your own vehicle into the woods and come across a calmly flowing river with no bridge over it. The river is about 100 to 130 feet, roughly over 30 meters in width and you can see a road on the opposite bank. Most often, you will be tempted to cross it but are cautious. Let's say if there was a sign that mentioned the average depth of the river was no more than 3 feet, would you cross the river? Now you would feel more confident and tempted to cross it, right? But then you are a seasoned adventure traveler and decide to venture out and wade the water to check the river for a few feet. After wading a distance of about 50 feet, you are fairly satisfied that the water was not more than one foot deep. With this newfound confidence, you will definitely try to cross the river. If you did think that way, then before you take the decision to cross, let us examine this data. It is given that the average depth across 130 feet width is about 3 feet. You have managed to capture the depth of water wading across 50 feet width of the riverbed. The data you have collected for every 10 feet of distance you've moved across the riverbed is as follows. From this table, we see that we have taken 5 measurements and the cumulative depth we obtained was 3.6 feet. Therefore, the average depth for these 50 feet across the riverbed is a mere 0.72 feet. This is way lower than the 3 feet average that was indicated to you. If we are measuring the depth every 10 feet, then we will have 13 measurements across 130 feet. Using the concept of average, we observe that to get an average depth of 3 feet, we need to have a cumulative depth across the 13 measurements to be 39 feet. This means that across 13 minus 5, which is 8 readings, we need to have a cumulative depth of 35.4 feet. This gives us an average depth for this remaining distance to be a little over 4 feet and 5 inches. Now, this is remarkably interesting. For a man of average height of 5 feet 7 inches, 3 feet is just about thigh deep water and 4 feet 5 inches is about chest deep water. This is way deeper than what we had expected and should immediately ring the alarm bells of caution in our head. Now, consider checking out this data on the actual depth of the river. The table depicts the measurements for the depth taken in feet from one bank of the river to the opposite bank at every 5 feet interval. The river is about 130 feet wide, not an awfully long distance by any means. With this data, the average depth of the river comes to little less than 3 feet and the standard deviation or the spread being wide. However, it does not answer the question how wide is wide. But when we plot this data on a graph using a smoothened line instead of points, the surprise springs at us. You will notice from this graph that though you had waded in the water for some distance from the shore, you had not done so far enough into the riverbed. If you had chosen to cross this river, you, your family and your friends would have had been in for a disaster. Usually, such river crossings are undertaken with a high degree of caution. A spotter wades deep further right up to the opposite bank, wielding a long stick checking the depth at regular intervals. Only when it is considered safe, the decision to cross the river is taken. 
In fact, what the spotter does is to check the distribution of the dip across the riverbed. In such cases, averages can be misleading since extreme values can bias the outcome. And standard deviations are best left to the expert statisticians to interpret. This is exactly why topographers rely on the depth maps or topography maps that plot the surface across either a water body or land. These topographical maps are nothing but a simulation of a distribution of either the height or the depth across the surface. These maps help us navigate a mountain, river or even an ocean. Wow, you and your family just got saved by using the concept of distribution. Now, some of you may even debate, well, I'm not even an adventure loving person, why do I need to bother? Fair enough. So let's take another example from marketing. If you've seen this video on probability distribution over here, I had taken an example of Tomota cars. A survey of 300 households was undertaken to study the ownership of cars in a particular state. The survey was done since from another independent study elsewhere, it was known that owners of two or less cars tend to purchase an additional car. So the manufacturer wanted to know if it was worth the effort to chase such people. The sample 300 households were chosen in a manner that they represented most of the households in that region. The outcome is depicted in this table. We have the car ownership in the leftmost column followed by the number of households owning the cars. We can calculate the probability distribution for each car owning household by dividing the relative frequency of the household by the total number of households surveyed, that is 300, like so. Here, we have used the empirical process to calculate the probability distribution. From this table, we understand that there are 70% people in the region who own two or less cars. This is a sizable number of people and definitely worth chasing by the car manufacturer. When we plot the distribution on a graph, we get the probability mass function since we are dealing with discrete variables. To gain elementary understanding about probability distribution and probability mass function, you should watch this video over here. The link for the video is posted in the description below and the info card posted above. Alright, if you are an engineer working in the IT industry, then this next application on probability distribution will amaze you. Let's say you are a team leader on an application support project. Your team has had a hectic schedule through the week resolving tickets raised by your client. The only relief for the team is a weekend which everyone looks forward to. However, you are especially wary of the high severity tickets that require immediate response and above all, a subject matter expert's presence. High severity tickets not meeting the reaction timelines can result in a heavy penalty for your company. But you have decided to give the team a less stressed schedule using a more planned outlook to be able to manage the weekend load effectively. From historical data, you know that 20% of all the problem tickets the team has received are high severity tickets. You also know that roughly 10 tickets in general are raised every weekend. To be able to manage the workload, it is imperative to know what the likelihood is to receive high severity problem tickets over the weekend. Well, there's nothing to break into a sweat over here. In this case, we will theoretically calculate the probability distribution using a mathematical model. You already know the overall probability of high severity tickets, which is 20%. And you know that roughly 10 tickets are expected over the weekends. Using these two facts, we can compute the probability of receiving a high severity ticket over the weekend. For such an instance, we use what is called the binomial experiment. Binomial means that there are only two outcomes, either a high severity ticket or not a high severity ticket. Here, I'm sounding a nerd alert since there is a mathematical equation in tow. But don't sweat over it. We are not deriving the equation. We are simply going to use it. Following is the equation for binomial distribution. Here, x is the random variable depicting the event in our case receiving a high severity ticket. R is the value of the random variable which could be 0, 1, 2 and so on. T is the probability of the event taking place in our case 20% or 0.2. 1 minus P is the probability of the event not taking place in our case it is 1 minus 0.2 or 0.8. NCR is the number of ways in which the event can take place. 
To keep things simple, we will not bother ourselves with this now, since this is a part of the derivation of this equation. When we substitute the values, we get the following set of numbers. And when we plot these numbers on a graph, this is the graph we obtain. This represents the probability mass function graph since we are again dealing with a discrete random variable. If we observe these numbers and the graph carefully, we see that the probability of getting up to 4 high severity tickets is 0.8598 or about 86%. In other words, you have an 86% chance that 4 in 10 tickets, that is 40% of the tickets, would be high severity tickets. So, instead of the entire team being on an alert, you could plan for two engineers and one subject matter expert to be kept on standby every weekend. The three people can be rotated through the shifts in such a way that every person in your team can now start enjoying their weekend. Isn't that insanely awesome? With this secret sauce, you have now become a cool dude in the eyes of your delivery manager. Not that it's likely, but on a lighter note, we can expect your next promotion soon. So if you have found value till now, click the like button and share the video amongst your friends and acquaintances to drop them a hint or two on how to get promoted. Do subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell icon so that you won't miss any of my videos. Alrighty then, not all servicing issues can be solved using binomial probability distribution. In this next example, we will solve some issues for McDumwall's Burgers. McDumwall's Burgers provide a drive-in service window in quite a few places. They know from historical data that on an average about 10 people get serviced every 15 minutes at their service counters. They want you to tell them how they could use this information. To begin, when we have the average probability of an event per unit time interval, it calls for using a Poisson probability distribution. Note the pronunciation. It's Poisson and not Poison. Let me sound another nerd alert over here since we will now encounter the equation for Poisson distribution which is as follows. Again, for the sake of this tutorial, we are not looking at the derivation of this formula. In this formula, x is the random variable depicting the event. In this case, number of people serviced in 15 minutes. r is the value of the random variable which could be 0, 1, 2 and so on. mu is the average probability of the event. And e is the Euler's number which has the value 2.718. Let us calculate the probability of 5 people being serviced in 15 minutes. Here, we know that mu is 10 since 10 people are serviced in 15 minutes. Substituting the values in this equation, we get the probability for x equal to 5 as 0.0378 or 3.78%. So, intuitively, if 5 people get serviced in 15 minutes with a probability of 3.78%, then one person should get serviced in three minutes with the same probability, right? Wrong. In this case, it does not work this way. We will need to recalculate the average service time for the change in time interval. If in 15 minutes, 10 people get serviced, then in three minutes, two people will get serviced. We get a new average for the changed interval. This is a better average number since it gives us a simpler understanding of average service efficiency. Now, using this new average, let us calculate the probability distribution for the various number of people being serviced in 3 minutes. The probability distribution for up to 10 people being serviced in 3 minutes is like so. The PMF plot for this is like so. Using this data, if we add up for the first 4 people, we see that 80% of the time or 4 out of 5 times, Four customers will get serviced in three minutes. Now that gives us a better perspective of the servicing efficiency. With this newfound understanding, McDonald's can use these figures to advertise their servicing efficiency or use it as an internal benchmark to improve themselves. Well done, you have just solved a major problem for McDonald's burgers. The owner of McDonald's is jumping with joy and urging you to subscribe to this channel if you have not done so far. All right. Till now, we have played around with two types of discrete probability distributions. These two probability distributions are used to solve a multitude of business problems. However, there are others as well that get used in specialized scenarios. Additionally, you also saw in the beginning how depth maps, contour maps or topography maps that are based on the concept of distribution can help us navigate 
deep water and high mountains. So let me know by typing a yes or a no in the comment section below whether you have used probability distribution to solve a business or household problem or maybe even save lives. To summarize, always remember that probability distribution of a random variable can be set up in three ways. First, empirically, that is based on experiments and practical experience like we saw in the case of Tomota cars. Second, theoretically, using a mathematical model which we used for the IT problems ticket and McDonald's burgers scenario. And third, subjectively based on assumptions or conviction of a decision maker which could be you or anyone else in your organization. As far as possible, we should aim for the first two methods in estimating the probability of an event, since in the third case we are leaving too much to chance and bias. Further, here are a few thumb rules to remember that I promised that I would share with you. If you are given an exact probability like the one we saw with IT problem tickets and you want to find the probability of a discrete successful event happening a certain X number of times out of N times like the high severity tickets out of 10 tickets use the binomial distribution. In case you are dealing with an average probability of an event happening per unit that is per unit's time, per unit cycle or per event and you want to find probability of a certain X number of events happening in a period of time like in the example of certain number of customers being serviced in 3 minutes, use the Poisson distribution. For Poisson distribution, if the time interval changes, the average probability changes as well. The Poisson distribution usually gets used often in the calculation of the probability of rare events. Having said that, you can look forward to the third and the final part related to continuous probability distribution in this three-part series of tutorials. You will not miss that episode if you hit the subscribe button and click on the bell icon to notify you when the video gets released. And oh yes, do like and share this video. It simply encourages me to put up more good content for you. It also helps YouTube to share these videos with like-minded people who are interested in growing their understanding in statistics and data science. You can watch the first video on probability distribution over here. Periodically, I post videos on psychology and personal development as well. The playlist is linked over here. And here is a video YouTube thinks you may like. Thanks for watching. As usual, stay healthy and stay peaceful.